All right, uh, we'll start. Yeah. Okay. So just uh, very briefly reviving the motivation. So think may all sentient beings possess happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings not be separated from happiness that is free of suffering. May they abide with equanimity, free from attachment, hatred, and indifference. So just repeating that to yourself, letting it reconnect, letting it be as true as it can be. Okay. Okay, so on Wednesday, you continued with the series on refuge, and um, particularly on Wednesday, you were looking at problematic types of refuge, kind of what we turn to if we don't have something better, or if we forget that we have something better. So I'll just very briefly review that and see if you had kind of um, stuck spots or interesting ideas that you felt comfortable sharing. So we were talking about these eight worldly concerns, which are like limited forms of quote refuge that actually lead to more suffering. And these eight worldly preoccupations or concerns or samsaric dharmas are like pairs of hope and fear. And we're, we're saying that hope and fear in this context are negative because they're based in things that are unrealistic. So we hope for happiness, comfort, pleasure, and we fear suffering, discomfort, pain. So then we turn to things that are conditions for these because we don't understand the substantial causes, the deep causes. And when we're in an agitated state of mind, we kind of are comfort seeking or preoccupied with things that make us uncomfortable. So you'll notice this physically or mentally or both, right? Where your body is uncomfortable and so your shift position, shift position, shift position, or you're chasing comfort and so you keep adding cushions and adding cushions and adding cushions, but it's usually symptomatic of an inner turmoil, which is unsettled. So the inner, seeking of, of comfort and avoidance of discomfort or the outer or physical, it can kind of be chicken or the egg, which one is first, but they often correlate, although they don't have to. And this is not saying that it's not normal or even has a, no, doesn't have a purpose. Wanting comfort and avoiding discomfort are not problems in and of themselves but they become the focus of our whole life. And they kind of have a, an exaggeration of what it is that gives these. So that's what's problematic. Not the kind of baseline, just you know, trying to be comfortable, that's fine. It's when you're chasing and hungry and agitated together with those drives. So then you have this, also have this hope for fame or good reputation or to be thought well of or favorably of, and you have fear of insignificance or infamy or to be thought ill of or poorly of. So a lot of our mental space is focused on worrying about what people think of us. And you kind of go back and forth between, I hope they like me, I hope they don't not like me. I hope they like me, I hope they don't not like me. And this consumes a lot of mental energy and it might be something that is very quiet under the surface that drives kind of an inner anxiety where you might not be thinking in words, gee, I hope everyone likes me, but underneath is a real hope and need to be seen in a good light. And that 
consumes a lot of mental energy. And then similar to that is not just being well thought of or not being poorly thought of, but being spoken well of and being praised and validated. And you're afraid of being blamed or criticized or spoken poorly to. So whether it's how people think of you or how people speak to you, we put a huge amount of investment in what people do or say has a direct impact on my happiness or my suffering. And that's exaggerated. It's not like there's no role in how people treat us in our happiness. It's that we exaggerate how much and why. And then we also have this hope for gain or acquisition of people, possessions, or status, or a fear of loss, deprivation of people, possessions, or status. So all of this is based on an assumption that you need what you hope for in order to be happy, and that you can't be happy if you don't have them. And this is problematic for a lot of very obvious reasons. And this is very obvious because this is our daily life, hopes and fears, but we don't realize how much we turn to them as limited forms of refuge that will never really hold us well. So these eight worldly concerns kind of boil down to pairs of attachment and aversion or push and pull. And there's a feeling of, what is happening right now is too much or not enough. And you're either chasing or running from internally what's going on for you in the present. So you're not present when the eight worldly concerns are right, kind of your main drives. You're half present and half trying to fix something in a little bit of a neurotic way. So when you see this list, um, do you have thoughts or questions about it or objections to the way it's framed? Do you understand how, while they make sense, while they're normal, while they're human, they're all problematic because they exaggerate? They exaggerate, yeah. So all you need to do to disprove them to yourself and see that they're not good forms of refuge is to take one pair like seeking pleasure and avoiding pain and ask yourself, have there been times when I was unhappy but had a pleasant experience? Have there been times when I was happy but things that were unpleasant were happening? You know, something as simple as people who like to exercise, at first it might be uncomfortable to exercise, but you know what it leads to. And so your mind is kind of happy about it and you get on a roll, for example, right? Um, things like gain and loss, you can think about how the last time you really, really wanted something, someone or some situation and you gave it the power to give you happiness. And then you finally got it, whatever it was. And the very next moment was an anxiety about losing it, or it wasn't as wonderful as you thought it would be. Or times when you were so scared to lose something or someone that it opened up a whole new realm of possibilities. Yeah. Does it, does it remind you of what you hear from your patients every single day? They're kind of trapped in the eight worldly concerns. They give all of their power to the eight worldly concerns and then they suffer. And it's the contents of their whole world. Do you, do you agree that's the source of a lot of the suffering of people that you hear? I think people especially are, uh, I mean, I thought about my patients when you talked and I thought that to each patient has his one specific pair maybe that is more dominant. I mean, we all, meet all of them, I guess, but I thought about one specific pair for every, what, every one of my patients, which is more dominant in their suffering, I think. Yeah, definitely. And it's, I think it's quite common for there to be a dominant pair. And if we can find our dominant pair, that can be really useful in um, changing the problematic habits of our daily life 
and kind of freeing up more mental space. If you can kind of go, oh, that set, that set is very much mine. And of course, yeah, we cycle through them, <laughs> but um, and different times of your life, different ones are more important. But it, the way that you break the spell is seeing how none of them are always true in terms of giving you happiness or suffering. If you have a very good reputation and everyone thinks well of you and thinks that you're amazing, what is the problem with that? It suffocates your time. You have tons of demands. There are all sorts of expectations. If people don't like you, if they don't think well of you, if you have a bad reputation, you see who your real friends are, right? <laughs> Who's there not because of your status. And you also have all sorts of time and space open up to pursue different things you're interested in. You also have an affinity for people who are looked down on and lowly, a different kind of compassion and empathy opens up, right? So, you know, it's all these things which are so easy to understand intellectually. You know, like think about how much you like it when people praise you and validate you and tell you that you're doing good. And yet, why do people validate? Sometimes it's because they care about you and want to support you. And sometimes it's because they want something from you or they have a bunch of attachment towards you. You don't know why people say what they say. And when people criticize you, you hate it. It's a terrible feeling to be spoken badly to. And yet it can be the very thing that shows us that someone is suffering, needs our help. You know, it could be the very thing that shows us something about ourselves that we need to address. So we have these like rock solid opinions about what is necessary for our daily life contentment, but they're lies we tell ourselves and it's disempowering over time. Th more of thoughts about, yeah, go ahead. Don't praise anyone. You don't go and praise someone who does something good or, or uh, validate someone. And can you do it without attachment to get something for yourself? And what does it worth? Is it worth anything? Well, well, yes and no, right? It's like for all of them, it depends. The problem is not the kind of baseline assumptions about what leads to a harmonious society or nice dynamics. The problem is, is that we make it too concrete. And we say in our mind, praise is always good. Criticism is always bad. Neither of them are always. Sometimes praise is negative and not useful and full of attachment. Sometimes it's full of love, support and kindness but neither of it is always, right? Like sometimes criticism really hurts. It was meant to wound. It was coming from an unkind person. And sometimes criticism was actually a form of support and honesty that was really valuable. Or maybe it was from an unkind person, but it shows us something about what they need or what the community needs, right? So it's not the issues themselves, it's that we make them too solid. And we have all sorts of assumptions about what they mean. And it just suffocates the creativity of our daily life. And it puts too much pressure on outside things to make us feel a sense of well being. Well being comes from your inner attitudes, right? So take the power back. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, certainly validation, sometimes excellent, but thinking that it's a requirement for your happiness is a problem because then what if it doesn't come, <laughs> you know, or you only know if you've done a good job or have been useful if someone validates you. So it's, it's really interesting because with all of these, these are things that we want to take the power back from as an individual but then how we act towards others is almost a contradiction. The way we act towards others is because we know that they seek comfort and avoid discomfort, we try and give them conditions for comfort. Because we know that people want to be thought well of and want a good reputation and want to be spoken well of, 
we talk about them kindly and we speak to them with validation because we know that that helps and those are conditions for their happiness. We know that people want to gain and acquire and feel abundance in their life. So we do what we can for them to feel that while at the same time internally telling ourselves, none of those things really matter, <laughs> right? It's taking the power back from them while acknowledging we have a habit of giving power to them. Do you, do you know what I mean? So we're not expecting other people to be having the same internal conversation about problematic forms of refuge that we have with ourselves. We're not expecting them to have those series of thoughts unless they want to have that conversation. We're expecting that people in their daily lives are very busy, very habituated, and only have space to look deeply sometimes. And so we're not putting a pressure on other sentient beings to suddenly be free of the eight worldly concerns. We're just noticing them both in others and in ourselves to try and take back a little bit of the power from them. And then when there's space, when there's opportunity, maybe you can invite some other possibilities for other people but these are mostly things to check in with with yourself and ask are these reliable useful sources to put my you know investment into yeah other other thoughts about the eight worldly concerns and this is of course the end goal but uh, on the path people do need uh, sometimes uh, uh, praise for, from us or mirroring from us uh, because they lack, lack it in their childhood or any reasons. Uh, so on the way, uh, they may need it. A way to maybe to the, that end, yeah? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's exactly what I'm saying is that just because we know the praise doesn't give the happiness, doesn't mean we don't give praise to others because it is a condition. It's just not the substantial cause, you know? So we offer praise and validation to people who obviously need, as you say, mirroring, but we're also watching with a type of depth to see if maybe today they could use something deeper and more empowering and more self-reflective and self-aware than something they get from someone else. We can invite some sort of wisdom from them that helps them take the power back from the eight worldly concerns. But our ability to do that is very much reliant on us having done so. We need to have at least a little bit broken the spell of the eight worldly concerns before we can really invite that in anyone else. But a lot of the time you're just kind of in a way offering people the eight worldly concerns, because it's all they have. But you know there's something deeper. And so when they're ready for it, you're right in there to provide them with deeper opportunities for more stable forms of internal refuge. But it's certainly like, in the beginning, people just need security, right? It's like what we uh, say uh, about uh, mirroring for the Buddha potential. So, like, if a person has uh, uh, received by some uh, kind of uh, um, uh, some kind of uh, I don't know uh, a new flat uh, in a very good uh, place, and then we can praise him about uh, what he thought about. Uh, a room for his grandmother. I don't know why. why. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Or about the hard, or the hard work that was, or about his honesty, the way he did it. Or, yeah, exactly. You're you're mirroring the higher qualities related to that kind of ordinary creature comfort, rather than praising their kind of more egocentric ambition, you know, that wanted to live in a fancy part of town or something. Exa exactly as you're saying, you know, you're really trying to shine the light on the highest reason. So the highest reason is more active. Yeah. 
Yeah, other other thoughts? Okay. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Even when you mirror the high uh, um, reasons, it's it's maybe it's the same. It's it's praising and making the people do that um, gesture because of uh, thing. I mean, it, it's 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 uh, you, you see the diff the difference. Okay, it's it, it's better, but it's the same uh, problem. Well, it's a spectrum. Right. It's it's a spectrum where there is the the perfect form, which is that you are free of the worldly concerns and you do not encourage them in other people. That's the highest form. But on your way to that, there's progressive steps, you know, so you tr you gently lift and lift and lift and lift at the speed and pace the other people are capable of, while at the same time you yourself acknowledging where you are and gradually lifting your motivation or deepening your motivation however you want to frame it over time right it's not like a sudden shift right but you you know a simple example when you're you know say you're hiking in the mountains and it's too cold but you have a nice view to look forward to you put up with the cold for the sake of the nice view yeah, but if you're just hiking and it's cold and there's no purpose in your mind, that cold affects you more. You use examples like this to realize that it's been your mental attitude towards your conditions that was one of the biggest factors in your sense of well being. And in that way, you stop relying on the temperamental attitudes of ordinary sentient beings and their afflictions and the transient conditions and resources and economics of the surroundings. And then you can be happy anywhere with anyone because you're freeing yourself from attachment. And so a loving thing to do is to meet people where they are and invite them to gently deepen when they're ready. But you're not pushing it, yeah? You're not forcing it. You're watching and inviting the next step from both yourself and others. So it's a spectrum. Or like an evolutionary process. So then we're saying then there's positive types of refuge, right, which give like an inner contentment that is consistent and less reliant on these external things. So we would say a set of ethics and altruistic motivations to orient one's life. So this kind of positive refuge can be a religion, a spiritual tradition, a philosophy, or a psychology. It doesn't matter as long as it's a, as it's a set of ethics and altruistic motivations to orient one's life. So like an inner belief system of core values that one, nourishes and uplifts oneself and creates attitudes and behaviors that seek to benefit others, society, and the environment, etc. And when you have this big picture mentality, a big picture mentality can cope with a lot of chaos. A big picture mentality is not so agitated by the everyday ups and downs of an ordinary life. And so this is what we would say is a healthy or positive type of refuge, as opposed to that kind of superficial attitude of the worldly concerns. So when we see that people have the potential to connect with something like this, we give the best conditions we can for them to do so. So that framework of like a negative refuge and a positive refuge, does that work for you or do you find it problematic in some way? Eye-opener for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think how much I um, 
invest in having everything comfortable for me. Yeah. And it's really almost a religion now. Yeah. Yeah. Same for all of us, right? Yeah. And it's just a matter of um, noticing and catching it already starts to interrupt the pattern. You know, I mean, a lot of us were brought up and reinforced to believe that these are the sources of happiness. It was, you know, it was taught to us almost or modeled for us. So why would we think any other way? But, you know, kind of if we are a little bit objective with our life, we understand that we've had more power and more control over our own contentment than we've allowed ourselves. And we've, you know, we've even taken opportunities to give ourselves that contentment, divorced from the eight worldly concerns, any number of times. We just haven't framed it that way or made it intentional. But we can, and that will make for a simpler, happier life. <laughs> yes. Slowly, slowly. So okay. Yeah. Someone who is a low self-esteem, will you offer some praise or will you show him another way? Well, this is the whole point, right? Does it always work to praise someone with low self-esteem or is it a bottomless pit that will never be filled? For some people, a little praise is enough and it really helps. Yeah, a little praise really lifts them out of their mood, really helps them identify with their qualities, and they shift the darkness. For some people, a little bit of praise is like drinking salt water, and it makes them more thirsty. And, you know, so this is the whole point is taking the power back from situations and from contexts by seeing that it's changeable, it's contextual. And so if one strategy that normally works doesn't work, you can have a flexibility and a creativity to shift forms. And acknowledging that we're so ruled by the eight worldly concerns can help us navigate our interactions with other people to be more kind of playful and spacious when one strategy isn't working. Do you know? And this is part of why we have this aspiration to Buddhahood is that if you're a Buddha, you have a clairvoyance and omniscience that knows what this person needs right now. This sad person here might need a hug or might need space. They might need a conversation. They might need quiet, right? We don't know. We make an educated guess as ordinary people, but people are different and they change all the time. And that's frustrating because we genuinely want to help, but we don't really know what people need specifically in each moment, except to know that they want happiness and don't want suffering. But their conditions for those are very obscure to us. So when you notice the worldly concerns, you're just trying to break the spell, break the spell, break the spell. It's not always true. It's not as true as it seems. And yet we are trained to believe these are the sources of happiness and suffering. So what would I do with a person with low self-esteem? I would look at them first and really assess, does this one need words that are affirming or does this one need words that are challenging? Because it depends. But if I have a, an assumption in my mind of what always works, I'm not gonna see the person in front of me and what they need today. Just because normally it works doesn't mean it always does. Yeah. Uh, so uh, should, uh, should not be uh, with exaggeration, but, uh, like if that there is a Buddha potential in him, like in other people or in ourselves, but not too much, not inflated or, or, or. I mean, you can, it's, it's this thing where you're trying to see the potential of someone at the same time as seeing their present day reality and suffering. Yeah, it's a simultaneous focus. 
you see what they can be, you see what their potential is, you hold that possibility in your mind, but you're also seeing today they are suffering, today they are identified with all sorts of problems. And when you're holding those dual possibilities, then you can decide in the moment, today they need more focus on their suffering, or today they need more focus on their potential but you're not trapped by assuming people who look like this and say this always need this specific formula because that's not true all the time. You know, it's just like a breathing meditation, right? For most people, a breathing meditation settles their nervous system and helps them pacify surface distractions. But for some people, a breathing meditation gives them an anxiety attack. Right? So it's like it's a useful tool, but if you think it always works in all contexts, you're collapsing the creativity of the moment and not seeing the person in front of you. Yeah, so it's just it's having a wide open, flexible mind that can really see of the tools you've learned so far in your life today, which one is necessary and needed. Not the one you assume to be. So anyway, that's one way of um, manifesting love for other people, right, is to really see them how they are in that moment, in that day. But for us to really come back to a positive refuge for us is a set of ethics and altruistic motivations to orient one's life. And when you have that, you have a deep contentment that is not reliant on the behavior of other people and is not reliant on the conditions and circumstances of your environment. It sees those in their real light, that they are conditions, not causes. So then last week we were looking at love, particularly when it's combined with selflessness. So from your text, it said, combining an understanding of selflessness with love demolishes any sense of possession. Love infused with a sense of selflessness knows that ultimately there is no possessor or person to possess. There is no independent soul or essence in a person to love or to be loved. The highest love wishes beings to have the highest happiness and will show others the path to the end of suffering, the path realized and taught by the Buddha. So continuing on from that, we're just remembering from tenants that each and every external and internal thing has both a conventional or relative and an ultimate nature, right? Everything has a conventional and an ultimate nature. The nature found by a conventional consciousness that comprehends a deceptive object, a false object of knowledge, is relative. A nature found by a reasoning consciousness that perceives the meaning of suchness is a true object of knowledge. So suchness referring to the emptiness of inherent existence. So that being the case, because each and every external and internal thing has both a conventional and an ultimate nature, so does immeasurable love, right? Immeasurable love is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises, just like everything else. So there are causes and conditions for love. There are parts and context for love. There must be a mind to label love on a valid basis. Therefore, love can't exist inherently. Yeah, so this is just bringing in what you know about tenants, what you know about dependent arising, and now applying it to the specific context of love. So love arises in dependence upon many factors. We know this, right? But it's important to come to a depth of understanding with it. So there has to be an agent of love. For example, ourselves who love our good friend. There has to be an action of love. For example, ourselves wanting our friend to have happiness and the causes of happiness. 
And then there has to be an object of love, the friend that we love, for example. So there's a person doing the loving of someone. There's the loving itself of someone. And there's someone to be loved, right? These we could call the three spheres, agent, action, object, are all empty of inherent existence because they dependent, uh, dependently arise. We say this a lot in Buddhism. In this context, we're talking about love. These are the factors and it's obvious, but we have to really remember it. And then we add to that, so then how do we become an agent of love? So then it means ourselves learning and remembering love and then offering it, right? It doesn't mean that we're just like a nice person or a good listener or have some sort of superficial behaviors that society labels as loving. It means that we deeply understand love and remember what it's like to receive it and then consciously offer it. So then what is love and how do we act it? It's ourselves wanting our friend, et cetera, to have happiness and the causes of happiness, therefore understanding and doing those, right? Understanding what are the causes of happiness, understanding them deeply, then helping others connect with those. So then who is there to love, how and why, right? We see the appeal, and need of the friend that we love, et cetera, all sentient beings. So this is the, the tricky part with when you're trying to develop immeasurable love. So you start with someone for whom love comes easily, like your good friend, like your spouse, like your child, like somebody in your life who you just have like a spontaneous warmth. And you think about the way in which you find that person that friend like appealing or attractive and the reasons why you find them appealing and attractive are going to be somewhat self-centered and somewhat altruistic and you have to acknowledge all of that otherwise you're missing a huge piece of self-awareness so if you don't acknowledge the fact that a lot of the people you love satisfy your ego in some way you're missing a huge point of self-awareness but you also acknowledge that a lot of the people you love, there is a time and a place where it's not so conditional. When you want them to have happiness, whether or not there's a direct impact on you in your life, you want them to have happiness, whether or not they acknowledge your role in helping with that, sometimes it is open-ended. But you start with someone you love and you really look around the edges of how and why that love comes about. You unpack it intellectually. And then you ask yourself if you can expand that same warmth to acquaintances, yeah? And try to see them as somehow appealing and attractive and needing happiness, needing love. And then you expand it to en enemies and expand it to strangers and expand, 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 realizing that all sentient beings very much are the same in that wish for their happiness. And also very much the same in being confused about the causes of happiness. Most of them are very much thinking that the eight worldly concerns are the causes for happiness and are trapped by that lie. And it's poignant and it should make us really pursue giving them the deep causes, yeah, by acknowledging them within ourselves and then kind of being a condition for them to be able to see them. So it's simple to understand, hard to do, which is why we're talking about a lot of different angles on the same point. So then how is love experienced? How do you feel it? Someone might love you very much, but how do you connect with it? How do others connect with your love? And the agent of love has to know what love is. So it's given by someone who has themselves experienced love. And then the action of love has to be in a recognizable form. 
Yeah, for someone to experience the love, it has to be in a recognizable form or behavior. So that wish for happiness is expressed through understandable behaviors that are wanted and timely. Yeah, it comes at the right time and it's wanted in that moment. And then the object of our love has to want to be loved. The friend that we love has to be open to happiness. Some people are in the mood to be depressed and it's not that we stop loving them, but we, also, but we stop expecting them to experience our love in a direct way because right now they're close to it. So for love to be experienced, we're just remembering that there are many, many factors for someone to feel loved and the main factor is not necessarily that they are loved. And I'm sure you find this with your patients all the time, right? They might have a loving set of parents or a loving spouse, but they are committed to their depression or their stress or their rage. So the fact that they're surrounded by love doesn't mean that they feel that love or are enriched by it, yeah? And so we know this because we've observed it in other people. We probably, you probably observe it in your children all the time. You love your children so much, but they don't always sort of feel it. Sometimes they shake it off and tell you to go away, right? But really we wanna look at for ourselves, if we don't feel loved, why? Does it mean that we aren't loved? And of course, from a Buddhist perspective, we are flooded by love every second of every day by the Dharmakaya holy mind of all the Buddhas or however you frame the divine. But you, know, you really wanna sit with yourself with, just because I don't feel loved, does that actually mean I'm not loved? What are the conditions for love to be experienced? And there are many, many, and we only have control over a few. So acknowledging that makes it easier to let go and be spacious and creative. Okay, so we're just gonna do the quick love versus attachment conversation because it needs to happen for tidiness because sometimes we still get tangled. So this is just the dictionary definition. Dictionary definition. Love is an intense feeling of deep affection, sometimes a deep romantic or sexual attachment, or a great interest and pleasure in a person, activity, or object. That's how we use the word in the world. Do not confuse it with the Buddhist definition of immeasurable love. Attachment in the world can mean like affection or fondness or sympathy for someone or something. It can be an affectionate relationship between two people, which is not the Buddhist definition. So we just have to like name for ourselves that these words don't mean at all the same thing in Buddhism as they do in the world. So then in Buddhism, we have love being a sincere wish that others be happy. And the feeling that their happiness is more important than one's own in the moment because there's more of them and it's opposite in nature from attachment. And then attachment is a deluded mind that sees the object as attractive and like sinks into it and cannot separate from it. And it's one of the six principal delusions, one of the six root delusions. So love is by nature expansive and altruistic. Attachment is by nature confused and deluded and clings. Okay, so then we have like non-attachment and attachment in Buddhism. So non-attachment, this is from Minds and Mental Factors quite a few semesters ago. Non-attachment is an emergence from a non-desire for cyclic existence and the articles of cyclic existence, right? It doesn't mean disengaged from life. It means you're not craving for problematic behaviors like the 12 links of dependent arising. And attachment perceives an internal or external contaminated phenomena 
to be pleasant from the point of view of its own entity and thereupon seeks it, okay? So we have to remember that in Buddhism, attachment means exaggerated. It means exaggerated. It doesn't mean that there's nothing there that's true conventionally. So you could take a person and the person has a good quality of being kind and generous and funny and nice to be around. And that is true conventionally. But attachment sees those characteristics in isolation from all of their other characteristics. They're also someone who is maybe impatient and miserly and angry in traffic and all sorts of negative qualities, right? But attachment is choosing to see only the good in a very afflicted way, not in a decisive, I'm choosing to see the good, to bring out the good, to support the good, not that, but in like a blindsided way that is actively turning away from the fact of the negative characteristics. So you're taking the version of the person that is your favorite version and saying that's who they are in their entirety. And then when they act against that, it feels to you like they've broken a promise, like they've let you down. But they never said they were their best all the time. Or even if they did, we're adults. We should not believe that. No one is at their best all the time. So attachment sees a few things that are relatively true, but it builds a whole story and set of expectations. And that's what makes it very problematic. So it's like we want happiness for that person we're attached to, but we want them to be happy because they're more fun that way. <laughs> Yeah, and their happiness means maybe they'll give us some happiness and do stuff that we like. And it's very objectifying. Okay, so I know that you guys know this distinction, but just make it very crystal clear in your mind so that you know what we're talking about when we talk about love versus attachment. Okay. So then like experientially, I think it can help to kind of speak experientially about these two. So love sees the good qualities or positive possibilities of a person as well as their suffering and the negative behaviors that may flow from it. And it doesn't attribute substantial causation to conditions. Attachment sees the good qualities or positive possibilities of a person, object or situation in isolation from the big picture. It also exaggerates their impact on your personal happiness. So love wants happiness for the person. Attachment wants happiness from the person. And that's the easiest way to simplify it in your mind. Yeah. So love is open and joyful. Attachment is closed and anxious, but in the moment, sometimes it's hard to see the difference between the two because there's an element of pleasure for both. So love has a calmness and a contentedness. Attachment is excited and restless. Love is steady and consistent. Attachment is temperamental. Love has no expectations. Attachment has many expectations. So one person in our life who we say that we love, we only love sometimes and sometimes it's attachment and it goes back and forth and they do not exist at the same time. They are completely unrelated even though they have the same object. Yeah, and so when we look at these experiential descriptions, it can help us understand which one we've landed into, which one we're connected with when we're with someone. So if we're very excited to see someone and we might think, oh, that means I love them. 
But that excitedness, that restlessness has a type of anxiety. And often with it is, they are just for me. They should hang out just with me. And I don't wanna share them with anyone else. And it gets very closed and tight. Whereas when you're connected in love and you have that deep contentment, you almost want to share them. You think, oh, what a wonderful person. Everyone should experience what a wonderful person they are. And it's got an openness without fear. So with love, you have healthy boundaries. With attachment, you have no boundaries or few boundaries. And then when it goes too far, when you've offered too much, you create barriers. Yeah, so when attachment is eventually thwarted, which it always will be at some point, then it becomes concrete and says, here is my boundary, but it's actually a barrier. So healthy boundaries are a way of performing and enacting and giving love because you're being honest. So when you have healthy boundaries and love, you create sustainable agreements with people, sustainable agreements that you can consistently uphold. When you have attachment, you overpromise. Yeah, you commit to what you could do on your very best day or when they're at their very best and you inflate it to mean that's how you can always be because you assume that's how they always are. It's got kind of a permanent connotation to it. So then with love, you have practical pacing of what you can offer. And with attachment, you have a sense of like rushing and urgency. With love, you have communication. And with attachment, you have assumptions. Yeah, so you're not necessarily communicating, you're just assuming based on a limited set of criteria or a limited set of experiences. So it's so important for us to understand internally that boundaries are a type of honesty that facilitates stable, loving relationships. This is so obvious to you because you're analysts, but sometimes we forget it for ourselves. For example, when I am talking to my dad about how he manages having such a huge caseload of clients, you know, he sees, I don't know, sometimes eight people a day and he has so many people on his caseload. He says that the way he maintains energy is to be very clear with them that he does not take calls after six o'clock at night. And if it's an emergency, they call the emergency room. And because all of his clients know that, he is sustainably present during his working hours, and no one assumes that he's going to get back to them in non-working hours. But of course, there's plenty of people who take text messages and voice messages after hours, and that's fine for them because they have the capability for that. But I'm sure there's been the case where you've overpromised because you thought of the energy level that you have on your best day or the energy level you would like to have. And so you overcommit, you overpromise. And then what happens is you have a bad day or you get overtired or you're burnt out and then you feel bad about yourself or you resent them or both. But it was your lack of boundaries that made you not pace yourself. So having love is very honest. Having attachment inflates you and your possibilities or inflates other people and how reliable they are. There's always inflation and exaggeration at play. And one of the easiest ways to check if you have attachment is a feeling of urgency. Like this has to happen now. Very few things have to happen right now. Yeah, but if it feels like it has to, and there's that kind of panic, it's probably attachment. Okay. So love knows and accepts oneself. Attachment overestimates oneself. And then what is it to know and accept oneself? What is it to overestimate oneself? To overestimate oneself, we remember ourselves on a good day when we are especially present for others 
and our choices on their behalf were tangibly useful. We then think that our set of skills are permanent, stable, and consistently helpful in all contexts. It's an overestimation. To know and accept oneself, we remember that conventionally, we currently, not permanently, have a limited set of skills and abilities that are not always reliable and not always useful. Sometimes our choices facilitate progress towards stable happiness for others as a condition, and sometimes they don't. And that's not problematic. So the benefit to know and accept oneself and the disadvantage to overestimate oneself become pretty obvious. When we overestimate ourselves, we blame ourselves for not being effective when things don't work, and then we get depressed. Or we blame others for not being receptive when things don't work, and we get angry or resentful. Or we blame the system or the strategy, and we become apathetic when things don't work, okay? It's very obvious, but sometimes we forget, we get a bit depressive or we get a bit resentful or we get a bit apathetic and we realize actually there was an overestimation at play. So when you do know and accept yourself, you let things go without laziness when things don't work. And you enjoy being beneficial, but you don't over identify with it because that leads to pride and you pursue self-awareness and development in order to increase the benefit to all. So you're remembering Buddha potential. And so all of these measurables have both near enemies and far enemies, and probably we'll get to that next week in more depth, but just to kind of uh, summarize it, near enemies look like what we want to develop, but are not it. They prevent or inhibit the development of it, but are harder to identify. Far enemies are the opposite of what we want to cultivate, the other end of the energy, intention, and behavior. They stand in direct opposition to what we seek to develop and are more obvious and easy to identify. So then for love, what looks like love, but are not love, very obvious. Attachment, the wish to possess or be close to, because it exaggerates the person and their positive impact. And then pride plus attachment can like misunderstand the warmth that comes with ego satisfaction. And then we might have pleasure plus attachment, which misidentifies a condition for happiness as the cause. So attachment looks like love, but is not love. And when attachment doesn't get what it wants, it becomes the far enemy and confusions we have about our own experiences lead us to mislabel and seek them. So the far enemy is the opposite of love that blocks love. It's easier to catch. So obviously it's anger, the wish to harm. And this exaggerates the person and their negative impact. And then you get like pride plus anger, which misunderstands the cold and deflated feeling that comes with a thwarted ego or pain plus anger, which identifies a condition as a cause. So similarly, confusions we have about our own experience lead us to mislabel and avoid them. Okay, so your follow-up reading is ebook pages 37 to 41, which is hard copy 19 to 23. And I'll send you a reminder and finish up chapter two for your Wednesday readings if you haven't already and will dedicate. All sentient beings who although self in all appearances are dharma dhatu by nature have not realized it thus. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness. I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering. I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering. And I shall set in equanimity the cause of well-being free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. Okay, so thanks folks. And